Hello, my favorite managerial accounting students. Are you ready for Master Budgeting Chapter 8? I'm hoping you already read the chapter. Let's get into it. So Master Budgeting um, is a process that we use to create budgets in our organization. Uh, first, we want to understand what we're doing and why. So basic idea, a budget is basically a quantitative, a numeric plan for acquiring and using financial and other resources for the forthcoming time period. So of course, when we talk about budgeting, we're projecting forward. We're using past information to make financial plans going forward. So here, here's a uh, mind blower for you. The act of preparing a budget is called budgeting. Mm -hmm. Yep. The use of budgets to control an organization's activity Activities is known as budgetary control. I do want to emphasize this concept of budgetary control um, in that I see a lot of businesses and even individuals that create a budget for themselves. They set a plan, but they don't then follow up. They don't check to see how they've done in terms of meeting that budget. And quite honestly, that's the most important part. Um, making the budget's a great idea. It's a good exercise to get your brain around what you need to do. But the follow-up aspect, the budgetary control, is really the critical part. Um, think of yourself personally. Do you set a budget? Do you know how much money you can spend each month? Then do you follow up to see how you did in terms of your budget? That's probably the most important aspect. And what you'll see is here in Chapter 8, we talk about budgets. And then as we move into Chapters um, 9, 10, uh, yeah, mostly 9 and 10, um, we'll get into further details of budgetary control. So when we talk about the budgeting process, we've got planning and controlling. So the planning side is obviously developing the objectives, preparing the various budgets to achieve those objectives. So we're gonna start with a point that we wanna achieve a certain amount of sales dollars, and then we're gonna create a plan to go with it. The control side of it is the steps taken by management to increase the likelihood that those objectives that we laid out while planning will actually be a, attained so um, that we're actually going to achieve those goals. So what can we do during the process to make it more likely? So we have to keep checking in on our numbers, see how we're doing and make adjustments as we go to make sure that we meet our budget. That's the control side of it. So advantages of budgeting. It starts with defining goals and objectives and that's always a healthy thing to do which forces us to think about and plan for the future helps us allocate resources. So if you say that um, you wanna achieve a million dollars in sales next year, but this year you only sold 200,000, well, that's a big jump to go from $200,000 to a million dollars. So we need to allocate resources. Do we have enough salespeople? Do we have enough product? Do we have enough capacity to actually ship or make that amount of product? So we need to really think about our resources. So this budgeting process will help us allocate our resources and uncover any potential bottlenecks. It should help us better co coordinate our activities throughout the organization so we're all on the same page of achieving that goal and also help us communicate those plans throughout the organization. So we can have a plan of we want to achieve a million dollars in sales, but to individuals in their various different departments, that might mean different things. So the budget is a way of communicating that and laying it out numerically for people throughout the organization to see. When we refer to responsibility accounting, that's the idea that managers should only be held responsible for those things that they can actually control to a significant extent. So responsibility accounting is going to allow the organization to react quickly to deviations from their plans and learn from feedback. What does that mean? What does that have to do with budgeting? Well, the idea in the budgeting process is that if we have any kind of deviation or variation from our budget, we need to take a look at it. We need to ask questions and figure out what went wrong and correct that and learn from that feedback. When we talk about responsibility accounting, um, it is essentially the idea of figuring out, well, who am I going to blame? Who is responsible for this? Blame has such a negative connotation, um, but it doesn't have to be in a negative way. But who is responsible for this deviation from the budget, from the plan? And we need to find out what went wrong. Maybe there's a really good reason that we didn't adhere to the budget in a given area. 
or maybe we just need to tighten up controls a little bit. So responsibility accounting can be used in a positive way to fix problems without necessarily having the negative connotation of blaming somebody for doing it wrong. Um, though people do need to be held accountable. So as we start budgeting, we need to choose our budget period. So oftentimes when we lay out a budget, we do it for a one year period, often breaking it into quarters or even months. And then the concept of continuous budgeting, one that I like a lot, is that we have a rolling budget. So we do have a one year budget that rolls forward month to month or quarter to quarter. So as we approach the end of 2019, we're not running out of budgeted months. As we finish each month or each quarter, we would add another month or quarter onto the end. So as we finish one month, we budget one month further in the future. As we finish one quarter, we budget one month further in the quarter. So we don't get to December 2019 and say, oh my gosh, we need to do the 2020 budget. I have no idea what's going to happen. And it's really only a few days or a month away. So I like the continuous budget. That's a healthy thing for an organization to do as long as they're genuinely examining that budget each month, not just rolling forward, same as last month, same as last month. The idea of a self-imposed budget is that we're going to budget from the bottom up rather than the top down. A lot of times in budgeting, top management says, here's what we're going to do, and they tell everybody below them, this is what's happening. And that can be very effective and it can be done very well, but sometimes it doesn't get the buy-in of the people below them. So the idea with a self-imposed or a participative budget is that it's prepared with the full cooperation and participation of managers at all levels. So these managers or supervisors are going to say, here's what we think we're capable of doing. And then the budget will be based on that, pushing information up to top management. So advantages of doing a self-imposed or participative budget would include um, individuals feeling like they're members of the team. Well, here we get into warm fuzzies and accounting, which you know I'm not a big fan of. But the idea being that we're going to get more buy-in from people throughout the organization if they have input into the budgeting process. Um, beyond that, just from feeling like they're members of the team, a lot of times the people on the front line, the managers that are hands-on, are going to have more accurate estimates than people sitting in a remote office and who don't necessarily have a connection with that day-to-day -day work. So sometimes it's going to be more accurate. Uh, thirdly, we're hoping that motivation is higher. When individuals participate in setting their own goals, they might feel more of a connection and more motivation to actually achieve those goals rather than when those goals are imposed on them from the top down. And then finally, a manager who's not able to meet a budget impro imposed from above can just say, well, it was unrealistic. They didn't have a clue what they were talking about when they set those numbers. When we talk about a self-imposed budget, that excuse is eliminated because the budget numbers should be achievable, which leads to the opposite problem, which is called budgetary slack. A self-imposed budget needs to be reviewed by higher levels of management to prevent budgetary slack, um, which is the idea that um, if we let lower level workers, lower level managers set their own goals, they might set the bar too low so that it's easily achievable. Um, they really, in setting a budget, we should challenge ourselves a, a bit. It should be realistic, but it should be a bit of a challenge. But in self-imposed budgets, there is a tendency to set the bar too low, making it easily achievable. So workers can say, look, we did it. We achieved the budget. Um, so that's where management needs to review for budgetary slack. Human factors and budgeting. So in terms of our budget program, we need to consider these three factors. One, top management must be enthusiastic and committed to the budget process. Well, they don't have to be, but it's recommended that management be committed to the budget process. And sure, a little enthusiasm would help, but they need to set realistic yet challenging numbers. They need to, um, you know, raise the bar a little bit to challenge the organization to be its best. 
Uh, number two, top management must not use the budget to pressure employees or blame them when something goes wrong. Well, here we are back at the word blame. We just talked about responsibility accounting, and I'm all about holding people responsible for the things that they need to improve on. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Unfortunately, the word blame has a very negative connotation. We don't have to punish people. We don't have to shame them but we should pressure them to do their best. Um, the budget should create a little bit of positive pressure, positive motivation to get things done as financially efficiently as possible. So I don't love the word blame, but we do need to apply responsibility accounting. Here's where I think your textbook is a little bit too idealistic and warm and fuzzy. Um, in business, we do need pressure. We can keep it positive though. Number three, highly achievable budget targets are usually preferred when managers are rewarded based on meeting budget targets. Well, yeah, that's nice. That's where we talked about budgetary slack. So if we're going to reward our managers based on meeting their budget targets, those targets need to be a little bit challenging. We want them to be motivated, but not completely discouraged that it's unachievable. So we need to find that happy middle ground where we're feeling challenged, but not impossible. So this slide here, you might want to refer back to this um, slide 8-12. This is essentially the roadmap of the master budgeting process that we're going to be doing. I do want to note that it starts up here with the sales budget. So that's an important thing. We're going to start by setting a sales goal, and then everything else is going to fall in place after that. So we do a sales budget, which will tie into our selling and admin budget. The sales budget is going to push a production budget which oddly ends in an ending inventory budget. Kind of a strange thing to budget for, but you'll see why we do that in a moment. From the production budget, we have our direct materials, direct labor, and mo budgets. And then all of that goes into a cash budget. The cash budget has to be done before we do our budgeted financials, our budgeted income statement, and our budgeted balance sheet. So I'm going to try to get us through this as efficiently as possible, and you guys can refer back to it as you need help with your chapter eight work. Um, in terms of the big picture, we're gonna be doing these 10 schedules, and here they give you a bunch of words on the screen to read, and I'll let you read that on your own time if you're interested. So a master budget is going to be based on various estimates and assumptions. So as we do budgeting, remember in managerial accounting, we're not about precision as much as we are about relevance and timeliness. So um, absolutely, this is going to be based on estimates and assumptions. And some of these assumptions we're going to have to make in terms of um, payment patterns and collection patterns and all of that. And they may not always be true, but they are good enough for budgeting and managerial accounting. So the first thing we need to figure out in terms of starting our sales budget is was, what is our budgeted unit in unit sales and what is the selling price per unit and then finally what percentage of accounts receivable will be collected in the current and subsequent periods so in terms of how much will we collect now how much will we collect later so first a little snippet of excel here as we go through our budgets in this chapter, I want you to picture Excel, picture how you could use Excel or another spreadsheet software to help you in the budgeting process. In the real world, we do use Excel quite a lot in accounting and particularly for the budgeting function. Some larger companies have software specific to help them with budgeting, but uh, Microsoft Excel is a great place to start. Um, do keep in mind that you guys will be doing a budget spreadsheet assignment in, a, in Excel related to this chapter. So our sales budget, we're going to take a look at Royal Company and they're preparing their budgets for the quarter ending June 30th. So that quarter would be April, May and June. And they've laid out their budgeted sales for the next five months, 20,000, 50,000, 30,000. And then they go into July and August, 25,000 and 15,000. Turns out we will actually need this information, so we do need those projections, and the selling price is $10 per unit. So we start real simple. We just lay it out April, May, June, and then on the far column, we put the quarter that sums our budgeted sales and units. So April is $20,000 times $10 is $200,000, May is $50,000 times $10, and so on. I do want you to note over here in the quarter column that 
um, the budgeted sales in units is a sum. So we're just summing right across. But notice that the selling price per unit is not a sum. It's still just $10. Mathematically, we would be wrong to sum 10 plus 10 plus 10 and say that we have 100,000 units times $30. That would be blatantly mathematically wrong. So as we're doing these budgets and you're picturing doing this in Excel, um, it's important that we realize the quarter column is not always just a sum of April, May, and June. Sometimes it's um, a single point, which is $10 per unit in this case. So big picture, we're looking at a million dollars of sales for the quarter and we've broken it out month by month. And then we need to consider our collection pattern. So 70% is collected in the month of sale and 30% is collected in the month following the sale. And then they tell us that our March 31st accounts receivable balance of 30,000 will be collected in full in April. So what we're trying to do is understand our cash related to sales. So what are our cash collections going to look like related to sales. So in the month of April, we start by collecting the leftovers from March. So that's the $30,000 of accounts receivable. And then from our April sales, we collect 70% in the month of, which is 140,000, and the other 30% in the month following. So 30% times 200,000, the other 60,000 gets collected in May. And then in May, we're going to collect 70% of May. So 70% times 500,000. We collect 350,000 of May sales in May. And the other 30% of May sales get collected in June. What will be the total cash collections for the quarter? Can you project that? Do you remember what June sales were going to be? Were you able to come up with one of these figures? So the total for the quarter is going to be 940,000 and here's how. So we already knew 170,000 from April, April, 410,000 from May, and then in June we knew we were going to collect 30% times 500,000 is 150 of the May sales, and then we'll collect 70% of June, which is 3 300,000 times 70%, so 210,000. So in June, our total is 360,000. And then we add all of that up. So for the quarter, 940,000. What's accounts receivable at the end of the quarter? What's not been collected? It's the other 30% of June sales, right? And they're noting that down here, which is really important. So the other 30% times 300,000, the other 90,000 has not been collected. When will it be collected? July, right. So accounts receivable at the end of the quarter is 90,000 and we expect to collect that in the month of July. So our next step is to prepare our production budget. So the production budget must be adequate to meet budgeted sales and provide for desired ending inventory. So management at Royal Company wants ending inventory to be equal to 20% of the following month's budgeted sales in units. Hmm, okay, 20% of the following month's budgeted sales in units. And we already have 4,000 units on hand from March. So let's take a look at what this looks like laid out in a spreadsheet. So our budgeted sales in units are 20,000, 50,000, and 30,000, as we know. So then our desired ending inventory is going to be the following month, so 50,000 times 20%, and our desired ending inventory for April then is 10,000. So for the month, we need a total of 20,000 for sales and 10,000 for desired ending inventory, it means we need 30,000 units but we already have 4,000 on hand, so that means we need to produce 26,000. What's our desired ending inventory for May? 
So we'll take 30,000 for June times 20%, and that should give us our desired ending inventory for May. So quick check two, what's the required production for May? Well, let's go back for a second. So we were gonna take 30%, sorry, 20% times 30,000, that's our desired ending inventory. And we'll add that to 50,000 of total needs. And then our beginning inventory, we're gonna subtract our beginning inventory. Where do we get beginning inventory? It's the ending inventory from April and that will give us our required production. So 50,000 plus 20% of June equals our total needs. Subtract our beginning inventory, which is our ending inventory from April, and that will tell us our required production. Were you able to come up with one of these? I hope you got B, 46,000. Here's what it should look like. So 50,000 plus 20% times 30,000, so we're taking 20% of June, so that's 6,000. Total needs are 56,000. We subtract 10,000 that we already had in ending inventory. So in May, we need to produce 46,000. And again, for June, we do the same thing. This time we have to look forward to our July sales of 25,000 units. So we do need that information from the beginning of the problem. We take 25,000 units times 20% and we get 5,000. So our total needs for the month are 35,000. We have beginning inventory of 6,000, right? That came from the May column. So our total production needs to be 29,000. And I do wanna point out in the quarter column, look at these red arrows. So budgeted sales for the quarter, 100,000 units. So that's a sum of April, May, and June. But the next row, add desired ending inventory. The ending inventory is not a sum. It's the ending inventory at the end of June. It's not a sum. It's a balance at a point in time. So it's the ending inventory from June. I'm pointing this out because it's important for your budget spreadsheet assignment. Total needs then are 105,000. And then we subtract our beginning inventory and again, our beginning inventory is not a sum of April plus May plus June. It's our beginning inventory from the beginning of the quarter. So at April 1st, our beginning inventory was 4,000. So that gets subtracted here and our required production is 101,000. So then mathematically, this should all work out, but we need to be careful that things like ending and beginning inventories are not sums of three months, they're points in time. Those are balances at a given point in time. So next we need to prepare our direct materials budget, including a schedule of expected cash disbursements for purchases of materials. That's a lot to think about. We'll go through the details. All right, so at Royal Company, five pounds of material are required per unit of product and management wants materials on hand at the end of each month equal to 10% of the following month's productions. Um, and 13,000 pounds of material are on hand and material costs 40 cents per pound. Okay, that's a lot of information. Let's look at how to lay that out and digest all of that. So our production that we computed from our production budget, that's our starting point, and then we know it's five pounds per unit, so we multiply each of those figures by five. So for April, we need 130,000 pounds, but then they also told us about the desired ending inventory. They want 10% of the following month's production needs. So we take the 230,000 uh, pounds from May, we multiply it by 10%, so we have desired ending inventory of 23,000. So our total need for April is 153. We subtract the 13,000 that we already have. So we need to purchase 140,000 pounds. Okay, now let's try it for May. So production is 46,000 times five pounds, 230,000. But then we also need to add in our desired ending inventory, which will be 10% of the next month. So 10% times 145,000 is 14,500. 
So our total needs will be Do you have it? Okay, and then we're going to subtract our beginning inventory. Where will we get our beginning inventory from? Our ending inventory from April becomes our beginning inventory in May, and that should get us to arrive at materials to be purchased. What did you come up with? A, I hope. Here's what it should look like. So the 230 plus 14,500, we've got 244,500. We subtract the 23,000 that we should already have on hand, and we need to purchase 221,500 more. All right, so then we need to finish it out for June, right? So 145,000, our desired ending inventory. Where did we get that? They don't show it very well. We'd have to figure out July and multiply 10% of our July needs. So we'd have to be making a computation over to the side on a piece of paper, probably. So our total needs are 156,500. We again subtract our beginning inventory, which came from May, and we need to purchase 142,000. And again, these arrows are pointing out a couple important things here. Um, some of these rows, we can just sum them across, and that equals the quarter. So production, we can add it up, and it equals 101,000. But materials per unit in pounds, we don't add that up. We'd get 15. It's just five still. Production needs, we can add across or multiply down, and it should work. Desired ending inventory, though, comes just from June. The ending inventory at the end of June. And then our beginning inventory is, again, not a sum. It's our beginning inventory from the beginning of April. So ending and beginning inventories, make sure you're not adding those, but rather taking them from the, from the months, the point in time where they came from originally. So we know Royal pays 40 cents per pound for its materials. And they tell us one half of a month's purchases is paid for in the month of the purchase, and the other half is paid in the month following. So if we have an accounts payable balance of 12,000 at March 31st, we're gonna to need to pay that first. So in the month of April, we pay off March accounts payable. And then from our April purchases, we're gonna pay for half of it in April and half of it in the month of May. And we got that by taking the 140,000 pounds times 40 cents equals $56,000. So half of 56,000 is 28,000 that we pay for in April, and the other half gets paid for in the month of May. So then also in the month of May, well, that's a hard question. What are the total cash disbursements for the quarter? Hmm. Well, also in the month of May, we'll have to pay for half of May, and then we'll pay for uh, the other half of May in the month of June. Let's skip ahead. Here's what it would look like for the quarter. So in the month of May, we pay for the other half of June, excuse me, we pay for the other half of April. Then we compute May. So May comes out to 88,600. And we pay for half of that in the month of May. And the other half, the other 44,300 gets paid for in June. And then for June, we figure out, we multiply by 40 cents, so the total is 56,800, of which we pay for half in June, and the other half is gonna get paid for in July. So tw the other 28,400 becomes our accounts payable balance at the end of the quarter. We still owe another 28,400 on the June purchases to be paid in July. So next we need to do our direct labor budget. So at Royal, each unit requires 0.05 hours. That's three minutes of direct labor. The labor can be unskilled because the production process is simple and they pay their workers at a rate of $10 per hour. So this is gonna be based on our production. So we take our units of production for each month and then we multiply it by 0.05 and that tells us how many hours are required. So in April, we need 1,300 hours, May 2,300, and June 1,450. And then we have our hourly wage rate, $10 per hour, 
and we get our total direct labor costs for the period. What about this though? What would be the total direct labor cost for the quarter if the company pays time and a half for all hours worked by employees over 2,000 per month? So if they're anything above 2,000 hours, they have to pay overtime at time and a half. So let's go back. First of all, if you're a manager and you see this production pattern, 26,000 in April, it spikes way up to 46,000 in May, and then drops back down to 29,000 in June. And then we look at our labor hours required. As a manager, is there anything that you wanna do about this? I feel like we should be pushing some of the May production into April so that we're not in overtime in the month of May. But that's not what the question asked. That would just be good managerial common sense to avoid paying overtime and to keep our employees steadily busy rather than not busy enough and then too busy in the month of May. But what we need to figure out is to the extent that this 2300 labor hours exceeds 2000, we have to pay time and a half. So we've got 300 hours that are going to incur overtime. Are you able to come up with one of these answers? Hopefully you got B. So the extra 300 hours have to be paid at time and a half. So they've removed those 300 hours and multiplied it by 15 rather than 10, and they come up with 52,000. Another way of looking at it is that we already knew 50,500 and you've got 300 hours that on which employees are going to need to be paid an additional $5 because it's already included at $10. So if I take 300 hours times $5, that's $1,500 more. And I could add $1,500 to $50,500 and come up with the same $52,000, maybe a little bit faster. Our next step is the MO budget, Manufacturing Overhead Budget. And at Royal, MO is applied to units of product on the basis of direct labor hours. So our variable MO is $20 per DLH, and the fixed MO is $50,000 per month, which includes $20,000 of non-cash, primarily depreciation. Right now, you may not care so much about the non-cash part, but when we get to the cash budget, then you will. So in terms of our MO budget, we take our budgeted direct labor hours, DLHs, and then we're going to multiply by the variable MO rate of $20 per hour. So we get $26,000, $46,000, and $29,000. And then we take our fixed MO, we add that in, and we get our total manufacturing overhead cost by the month and for the quarter total. So this next thing they're doing here, you might be wondering, why are they doing this? And we're going to come back to this number. We're not going to use it quite yet, but what they're doing is computing our predetermined overhead rate, right? Because we're projecting out our MO for the quarter, and we know our, our uh, cost driver, direct labor hours, so we may as well compute it now. So we're projecting $251,000 in total MO for the quarter. We're going to divide that up by 5,050 labor hours, and we should come up with a predetermined overhead rate of $49.70. For the moment, just stick that away in the back of your brain, and we will pull it out here in a moment. So from this, we can subtract our non-cash items, and we get our cash disbursement for manufacturing overhead. So we've got our manufacturing overhead cost, that's our cost for that period, but in terms of cash flow, we subtract $20,000 for each month, and we get these bottom numbers, 56,000, 76,000, and 59,000. Next, we need to do our finished goods, or excuse me, our ending finished goods inventory budget. So we need to know what we end up with, what's gonna stay on our balance sheet. So in terms of understanding our production cost per unit, we have direct materials, five pounds, 40 cents, so that's $2. Direct labor is 0.05 hours per unit times $10. 
looks like 50 cents. And then our mo is 0.05 hours, right? Because it's based on our direct labor hours and it's at 49.70. Ah, that's that number. That's our predetermined overhead rate. And that ends up costing $2.49 per unit. So our production cost per unit in total is $4.99. To me, this 49.70 part, I think that's one of the hardest parts of doing um, the, the entire budgeting process is connecting that, understanding that from your um, MO budget and computing your predetermined overhead rate and knowing to put that in here to compute your production cost per unit. I think that's tricky. So these slides are definitely ones worth marking and reviewing. So in terms of our budgeted finished goods inventory, we're going to take our ending inventory in units times $4.99 and we'll get our ending finished goods inventory. So how many units of ending inventory will we have? 5,000. We have 5,000 units. That came from our production budget a while back. Okay, so we didn't just now come up with that. That was from the production budget. So 5,000 units times $4.99, our ending finished goods inventory, which we'll need that on our balance sheet, will be 24,950. So then we get to our selling and admin expense budget. So lots of info for you here. Um, we divide it into variable and fixed components. The variable selling and admin is 50 cents per unit. And fixed selling and admin is 70000 per month. And they're letting us know that in terms of our cash flow, that fixed amount includes $10,000 in costs like depreciation that are not cash outflows, right? Because there's no cash involved in depreciation. So let's do our selling and admin expense budget. So in April, we've got 20,000 units times 50 cents each, and our variable selling and admin expense should be 10,000. Our fixed selling and admin is another 70,000, so total in terms of our expense would be 80,000, but for cash flow purposes, we subtract 10, and our cash outflow for selling and admin is only 70,000. Can you finish it out for the quarter? Sure, you're quick, right? It's B, 230,000. So for each month, we're taking our budgeted sales times 50 cents to get the variable amount. We add in our fixed of 70,000 to get our total selling and admin expense. And then for cash purposes, we subtract 10,000 each month. So the total for the quarter sh should come out to 230,000. So with all of that, now we're finally ready to do our cash budget. So the cash budget is maybe one of the trickier parts. Um, we're going to divide it up into four basic sections, some of these sections shorter than the other. Um, so first, we're going to start with our cash receipts. And that's going to show all the cash inflows, except for cash from financing. Um, part two, we're going to do our cash disbursements. So here you're going to be tying in a lot of the cash outflows from all these other supporting schedules that you prepared. Um, so that'll be all of our cash payments, except for those having to do with financing repaying the principal and interest on any financing. Um, part three is really just a computation where we're going to compute our cash excess or deficiency, meaning we need to figure out, do we have enough cash? Do we need to borrow any money? And then uh, we'll figure out if we need to borrow or repay. And then part four is our financing section that's going to detail out the borrowing or repayment and uh, compute any interest if we need to pay interest as well. So here's a ton of additional information for you. Assume the following. Uh, Royal maintains a 16% open line of credit for $75,000. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that they have a line of credit at their bank where they can borrow funds up to $75,000 and they have to pay interest at an annual rate of 16%. Right, it doesn't say annual, but unless it says otherwise, we assume interest rates are annual. Um, we need to maintain a minimum cash balance of $30,000. So, so to the extent that we don't have $30,000 at the end of any given month, according to our cash budget, then we need to borrow. If we're borrowing, we borrow on the first day of the month, 
and we repay on the last day of the month when we have funds available. Um, other info, we're going to pay a cash dividend of 49000 in the month of April. Oh, yeah, and we also purchased some equipment, 143700 in May and 48300 in June, both paid in cash. And we have a beginning cash balance of 40000 All right, so let's give this a try. That's a lot of information. So we have beginning cash of 40000 up at the top. We add in our cash collection. So this comes all the way back from the beginning, we did our uh, budgeted sales and our schedule of expected cash collections. So in April, we expect to collect $170,000. So we should have $210,000 available. Then we have all these cash disbursements, many of them coming from schedules that we already did. So materials, $40,000 comes from our schedule of expected cash disbursements. So from buying our raw materials, right? Direct labor. We computed that previously. Mo from our Mo budget, selling and admin from our selling and admin expense budget. So all of these were from different schedules that we previously computed. In April, we didn't buy any equipment, so that's zero, but it did tell us that we're gonna pay out a $49,000 dividend in the month of April. So we're gonna have disbursements of 228,000. So that's parts one and two. We need to compute part three. So if we have cash available of 210,000, but disbursements of 228,000, mm, sounds like we have a deficiency, right? So we do our math, we have a deficiency of 18,000, but we have a required minimum cash balance of 30,000 at the month. We can't budget ourselves to be deficient in cap, cash or even at zero in cash. We need to have a little cushion in there. So we need to have a cash balance of 30,000. So in order to achieve that, we're gonna to have to borrow $48,000 on the line of credit. And right now we don't do anything with that. We're not gonna compute our interest until it's time to repay. So we assume we borrow on the first day of the month and when we're able to, we will be paying that back on the last day of the month and we'll deal with the interest computation then. So we go ahead and we do the same thing for May. Please note that your ending cash balance from April, 30,000 as required, becomes your beginning cash balance for May. You again, you add in your cash collections. So you're going back to your budgeted sales and your schedule of expected cash collections. So we should have $440,000 available. And then we have all these cash disbursements. So materials, direct labor, mo, and selling and admin were from schedules that you already computed. And then they told us that we purchased equipment of 143,700. So we have disbursements of 400,000, which should leave us with $40,000 remaining. So that's not enough to repay the loan, but we also don't need to borrow any money at this time. So that's good, but we don't have enough to pay back the 48,000 that we borrowed. We need to hold on to all of that. So what's the excess or deficiency of cash available uh, for June? Can you do that in your head? That's pretty hard. Let's go ahead and take a look at how to get there. The answer is 130,500, but let's go ahead and look at that. So we took our ending balance for May, 40,000, and that became our beginning balance for June. We add in our cash collections of 360, so we have a total available of 400,000. And then again, we've got our, um, items here from the previous schedules. So you already computed these first four items and then it tells you that you bought equipment for 48,300. So we have disbursements of 269,500. So we have an excess this time, 400,000 minus 269,500. We have 130,500 available in cash. How much do we need to have? Just 30,000. So we have plenty of cash available to pay back what we borrowed, the 48,000. So we are presumably paying back that $48,000 on the last day of June. And with it, we have to pay back the interest. So with a line of credit, we pay the interest as we go. So um, when we pay it back, we pay the interest. So we'll take 48,000 times 6%, excuse me, 16%. That's the annual rate, but we didn't borrow it for a full year. We only borrowed it for 3 twelfths. So we're taking 
3 twelfths of that amount and we come up with 1920. So again, principal times interest rate times time outstanding and we have our interest expense for the quarter that we have to pay back in cash as well. So we're gonna be paying the bank 49,920 total and our ending cash should be 80,580. And then for the quarter, we need to be careful. Some of these we can sum across others, like the beginning balance just comes from the beginning of April. It is not a sum of April plus May plus June. Your beginning balance for the quarter is your beginning balance at April 1st. We can add our cash collections across and then our total cash available is 40,000 plus 940 equals 980. So uh, these ones here, these disbursements can all be added across. And then our excess or deficiency um, will be 980 minus 897,500. Our borrowing is the 48,000. Our repayment is negative 48,000. Our total financing um, it nets out to 1920, so that's what it ultimately cost us to have the financing. So the interest is what shows up there ultimately. And then our ending cash balance is not a sum across, but it's our ending cash balance at the end of June. So not a sum, but our balance as of June 30th should be 80,500. And mathematically, this should all work out. So the cash budget, I think, is the trickiest part. Our next job is to do the budgeted income statement. We can't do the budgeted income statement until we get that interest expense. And we can't do the interest expense until we figure out how much cash financing we need. So that's why we have to do the cash budget first. So then we move on, we do our budgeted income statement. So we take our sales, a million dollars is our sales budget. Our COGS, we're selling 100,000 units and we multiply that by $4.99. Remember, we computed our unit product cost. So our gross margin should be 501,000. Our selling and admin expense from our selling and admin budget is 260,000. And that leaves us with operating income of 241,000. We subtract our interest expense that we computed on our cash budget, and we get our net income of 239,080. And then finally, we do our budgeted balance sheet. So they need to give us some beginning balances for our balance sheet. We've got land of 50,000, common stock of 150,000, retained earnings of 248,650 at April 1st, and we already had equipment on hand of 175,000. All right, so a lot of information there. Let's go to the balance sheet, see where these numbers come from. So our cash at the end of June, remember we're doing our budgeted balance sheet for the end of the quarter. So our ending cash comes from our cash budget from the end of June. Accounts receivable, that's the other 30% of our June sales. Remember we talked about that way back when we did our budgeted sales and schedule of cash collections. Our raw materials inventory. So we still have 11,500 pounds at 40 cents a pound from our production budget. Our finished goods inventory was the 5,000 units at $4.99 each. Land, they're telling us we have 50,000. And then in terms of equipment, we take the uh, beginning balance of 175,000, and then we had two purchases, one in May and one in June. So we add that all up and we get 367,000. So we should come up with total assets of 617,130 which is a clue that we should also know our total liabilities and stockholders' equity should be 617130 Our accounts payable is half of our June purchases, so that came from our uh, schedule of cash payments, so $28,400. They're telling us our common stock is $150,000, and then you're supposed to compute your retained earnings. Do you remember how to compute retained earnings? This is a really critical uh, bit of knowledge that you should remember from financial accounting, but in case you don't, here's your quick refresher. You're going to take your beginning retained earnings balance, add your net income, which you needed to do your income statement first so you can compute your net income of 239080 and then you subtract $49,000 of dividends 
and you get your ending balance of 438730 And once you plug that in, your balance sheet should balance. Whew, that was a lot of steps in the budgeting process. I hope you were able to stay with me through it all. Um, please do refer back to these slides. This problem is a great example of how to get through all the different budget schedules and might be useful for you as you do your homework and your budget spreadsheet assignment. Let me know if you guys have any questions. You know where to find me.